Hello, everybody. Um, that was a tough, is a tough act to follow. Uh, and for all of you who wonder about what you can do with the rest of your day, I am literally the beginning of the end here. We are the, the last group of speakers. Uh, I would say right from the start, I share two qualities with the uh, previous speaker. Um, first, I had wrote a book that was translated into Chinese. No one told us it was being translated, nor have we seen any royalty checks, but it was translated. Um, and secondly, I am math challenged. Um, <coughs> that said, I have noted that if uh, I put a dollar sign in front of numbers, people take those numbers and everything else I say much more seriously. And so, despite, or let me see, in addition to all the wonderful poetry and really deeply felt sort of moral and philosophical things we've talked today about, I'm going to talk about numbers. And I think that one of the things we have to do as people who care about resilience is begin to help the rest of the world understand the numbers that are connected to resilience. Uh, and I say this in part because we are going to spend so much on resilience that unless we also use those dollars to invest in other things we need, oh, infrastructure, livability, and equity, we aren't going to be able to spend, we're not going to be able to, uh, to move those things forward going forward. So I am not going to talk about floating cities. I, I, I admire imagination. I would love to stop thinking and be able to see the world in new and different ways, but I can't. So, <coughs> so what I want to talk about, first of all, is the fact that this country is going to adapt to climate change because we won't have a choice. Uh, second, that uh, we are going to, in, to, to be able to do this, we're going to have to find a way, and I hope this will be clear in a, in a minute, to meld environmental and urban agendas. We're not going to be able to think of them separately, and we haven't talked about them in a combined way yet today. And third, and this is in the spirit of the, uh, uh, the speaker, I'm sorry, I, I'm not recalling your name, who, who read the quote, uh, uh, basically, that, basic, that, that said, in effect, uh, that climate change is something we need to be optimistic about. And in fact, we need to be able to think of this as a way to inspire us to create better, more livable, more wonderful cities. <coughs> the costs of climate change are already very real. Uh, they, climate change is uh, happening faster than, than many, not in this room, but many of our colleagues in, in the larger world uh, will acknowledge at least. Uh, and the East Coast is probably going to be affected by rising seas more than almost any other part of the world. You've all heard the numbers, but five or six feet by the year 2100 uh, in terms of uh, uh, rising sea levels is very believable and considerably higher than other parts of the world. So you might say, go west, young person. Oops. Uh, all of America will be affected. We, we are all, as, as Ilya said, we're all in this together. So, we have already begun to pay a very considerable price for not addressing resilience. Uh, hurricanes Katrina and Sandy have probably cost this country, and actually these are numbers we don't really know. You can go on the internet and, and Google and find all kinds of numbers, but the most possible numbers are about, well, uh, <coughs> 2,000 lives, 100,000 people displaced, about $200 billion worth of recovery and rebuilding. But from Sandy alone, and no one calculated this for Katrina because we weren't thinking in those terms, about $100 billion of lost GNP. This is, it would, it, we could have saved a lot of money if we'd been all thinking about resilience a couple of years ago, but we're human and we don't work that way. <coughs> These, w these, the, the money that we are going to spend on resilience, we are also going to spend in cities. I just, out of curiosity, uh, went on the web to see what, was, what, what, what cities have the 10 largest economies in this country, and how many of them uh, are already facing uh, rising sea level change. They're, it's being discussed. They haven't had Sandy or Katrina, but, but everyone knows it's on its, the, the chal these challenges are on their way. And it turns out that seven of these 10 cities will be affected by climate change. These cities hold, and their regions, one quarter of America's economy. More important, actually, this is where our economy is growing. The economy in these cities is growing 50% faster. America's future is its knowledge economy, and that is rooted in these and similar cities. 25% of our economy. <clears throat> we will spend, I also went on the web to begin to see 
how much does it cost to build seawalls and how many miles of seawalls might we need? This is really elemental stuff. And I'm a humble urban designer who's number challenged, so somebody else should pick this up and move forward. Um, how much do, will it cost to uh, truck in sand to restore uh, damage along shores? How much does it cost to, to plant acres of, of wetlands? And you can very quickly get to the reality that we will spend more in current dollars on resilience, on making our cities resilience, resilient than we spent during the WPA, some in my office had never heard of the WPA, that's something we did during the Depression, to rebuild our cities, or combined with what we spent on the interstate highway program to basically dismantle our cities. Those are the two largest concentrated investments this country has made in, in the last century. <coughs> this investment in, in resilience clearly needs to be an investment in city building for the most pragmatic of reasons, forget moral or philosophical or even the most humane concerns. So how do we know, what, what should the agenda be? What is our adjournment? How should we shape an urban agenda, urban resilience? Well, actually, uh, the speaker who, uh, recorded speaker uh, who began the previous series said, uh, copying is a good thing, and in fact he's right, and the Dutch have been doing this not forever. They've been protecting themselves forever. They've cared about resilience forever, but they made the connection in about 1950, uh, at coming out of World War II, that they needed to connect environmental and urban resilience because they didn't have enough money to do both. And that is the, the first lesson that we need to, uh, to internalize. But there are three lessons. So the first of these, uh, three additional lessons. The first of these is no retreat. You've uh, seen this image before. I had uh, the honor and privilege and challenge of uh, doing about a quarter of the recovery planning for New Orleans and then leading the effort to prepare a master plan after Katrina. And we we're just finishing a, a third project, looking down at taking down an elevated highway. <coughs> One of the first lessons of Katrina is no retreat. What the Dutch meant by that is not that it is necessarily more economic to protect everyone. It is more about the fact that it takes a united society where everybody feels that they are in it together to protect itself. Resilience, uh, the most, uh, if I were going to, if somebody wanted to ask me what's the most important thing a city can do in order to advance resilience, I would say solve your racial problems first. Be a united community first. Uh, a certain very prominent congressman, I think these aren't supposed to be political, so I won't mention Newt Gingrich's name, but a certain very <laughs> prominent congressman basically said, well, wouldn't it be easier just to relocate New Orleans? <clears throat> when we started the master plan for New Orleans, a lot of folks wanted to abandon an area called New Orleans East, where 50,000 people had returned because it was so expensive. There, the, the density was very low. This city was broke. It became, and, and the area was in great peril, it became quickly evident that it would cost so much more to move 50,000 people. You had to solve issues rated, uh, ranging from substance dependency to families that cared for each other uh, to uh, 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 neighborhood culture that really was the social safety net of folks even before you thought about the fact that you had to find them all new houses and find a neighborhood that wanted 50,000 new people. Our country is not set up. We do, our democratic system does not allow us to do that. <clears throat> One of the, the most important things the master plan said, and it wasn't going to say this at first, and I can't go backwards, anyway, is this is a master plan for every person and every place. And that's something I think we all have to uh, in internalize going forward. Uh, the second lesson is to shape uh, <coughs> environmental resilience around an urban agenda. Sadly, we don't have one, and <laughs> uh <coughs> which is another problem that we should all be involved in. Uh, however, it is perfectly, many of the things that we have, we need to do for our cities are perfectly obvious. Uh, the same speaker who said, go ahead and copy it, said form follows finance. And since we're going to spend well over $1 trillion, at least twice as much as we spent on the interstate highway program, which transformed our country, <coughs> we have a whole lot of finance that form can follow, meaning we're going to have a chance to invest in very profound ways in the form, but I want to say in very humanistic ways, in the people and the forms that serve them in our cities. So what are some of the things that we might want to think about? Well, every city in America has aging infrastructure. 
Uh, there is no city in America that has a transportation system that can compete, for example, with uh, uh, what almost what any major city in China has built in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, largely because they've been built in the last 20 or 30 years, or uh, much of Europe. Uh, Hong Kong is uh, investing billions and billions of dollars in its transit system now, <coughs> and their goal is twofold. It is to connect 70% of their population within a short walk to transit, and it is to make sure that those people who need transit are, are connected to it. Let me rephrase that. that. That transit does not determine people's lifestyles, but, but, but people can live the lifestyles they want because of the transit that's available. So what are some of the things we can invest in? San Francisco would love to find $4 billion to build the Transbay Terminal, which is going to bring every bit of its transportation infrastructure together in the same place, which will do a great deal for mobility. It also will support a significant new urban district in San Francisco. And in an era where we don't tend to use it, no one's actually mentioned smart growth today, but smart resiliency is all about smart growth. It is letting the surge of, of interest in urban living happen, building for it. <coughs> but we also need to adapt transit to people, and we know this. Uh, this is a wonderful system at Heathrow that basically is like personal rapid transit. You can go where you want. We need to make these kinds of investments <coughs> in our cities going forward. Another major investment we will make, the most effective thing New Orleans could do, they, they have built levees which, um, and seawalls which and, and storm gates that w will be effective. I actually, um, I'm not going to say I would trust them because that's not fair to anybody. I don't live there, but, um, <coughs> but I think they'll work. Uh, the most important, effective thing New Orleans could do is spend about $50 billion to restore the wetlands that have been destroyed by the channels cut through them so that oil tankers could get to the port more quickly, bringing in salt water, which, which killed the wetlands. Uh, <coughs> many cities, uh, I think, need to explore. This is, this is a clear a avenue that is, uh, we call it soft resilience. <coughs> We did a master plan for the city, parks master plan for the city of Miami a couple of years ago. And so I had a chance to sort of look around and see what are cities in America doing to invest in parks. And basically, they haven't done much for 100 years. There are wonder some wonderful new parks in New York. There's Millennium Park in Chicago. But if you look, try and look for a city in America that has built a 21st century system of parks, that would serve 21st century America the way the Olmsted brothers uh, designed parks that served 19th and early 20th century America, and there isn't one. Well, the, the billions, hundreds of billions of dollars that we're going to invest in soft resilience give us the chance for, give America's cities that, that can, for whom this is important, a chance to build their 21st century system of parks. The Dutch who came, the Dutch came to New Orleans, they, were, they actually, <coughs> If you want to know who brought good advice to New Orleans, it was the Dutch. There was a program called the Dutch Dialogues. So they were saying, if you're going to build these wetlands, really build in such a way that, that enhance quality of life, that create new places for New Orleanians to come together. China has been doing this. There are marvelous parks in China that basically are protect about protecting Chinese cities from rising sea levels and, and flooding rivers. And actually, I was in China a couple of months ago, and on my way there, the fellow was bringing me over and said, you have to realize Chinese don't build parks. There aren't parks in Chinese cities. There are royal parks that were built hundreds of years ago. Well, that actually isn't true. It was true maybe 15 years ago, but because they have looked at restoring wetlands, at, at uh, turning uh, flooded creeks into wonderful, the hearts of communities. Many Chinese cities have a wonderful 21st century system of parks that is all about how people live today. This is uh, Marine <coughs> Bar Marina Barrage in Singapore, which is just magnificent and is basically about controlling flooding in, in Singapore. And this is Chang Yechen, <coughs> I think that's what it is. Um, uh, creek in Seoul. This was a, uh, an elevated highway. Uh, uh, the creek had been da had been uh, con basically put into a concrete channel under it. The city was flooding. Originally, they were going to create a, a, a very large pipe to carry the floods away. No, they daylighted daylighted the creek, and in <coughs> and in the process created the public place in Seoul. And Seoul, like Chinese cities, didn't really have a a tradition of public parks, and it now it does. 
So and now we come to one of the more sort of complex aspects of this, which is hard resilience. And this is where most of the money is going to go. These are the seawalls that a city that will be facing not just sea levels that by 2050 are maybe two feet higher than they are, and by 2100, five to six feet higher, but have to protect themselves from the storm surges of more frequent storms, which obviously uh, bring uh, water waves at a uh, very high speed uh, at much higher level. So <coughs> the Dutch now, instead of seawalls, have been building new neighborhoods to protect themselves. Mayor Bloomberg had proposed this with Seaport City. These neighborhoods are actually essential in a period when we are looking to also make our cities competitive in a global economy where bright young folks come to cities that are lively and vital and every city needs to compete. We have a shortage of these folks to become more vibrant. This is how we compete in a worldwide global knowledge economy. Uh, this is Hafen City in Hamburg, which is a wonderful expansion from a historic city that basically brings the 21st century in a way that blends and is inspired by the city's history. This is a seawall in, in Copenhagen that floats. Uh, this is Chung Chen Creek again in Seoul. It has become the central park of, of Seoul. And so this is what resilience should look like going forward. Well, I want to finish with another perspective, which is equity. Uh, this country has basically stopped trying to address uh, generational poverty. Uh, there's some, some recent studies that basically say the lack of, of early childhood intervention that, that we do, training, education, et cetera, probably costs us $500 billion a year today in terms of folks who can't enter our workforce, uh, whose health is greatly impaired, who frankly commit more crimes than, than they should, and in other ways cost us a vast amount of money. Well, <coughs> if you think back to something Ilya said, we're all in this together. Um, uh, resilience in New York needs to pay attention to resilience in South Florida. That means this will be a bottom-up process, as he described, but it's also going to be top-down. There will be a national strategy, national policies guiding a trillion or more dollars in a relatively condensed period. And here we have a chance to invest in the workforce readiness, the education, the preparation uh, that will bring people who are poor into our economy. About 40% of us aren't part of our, of our 21st century economy. Uh, and if, if we don't do it with this expense, we'll have no dollars left to do it. Uh, this is Hoffman City, is, is the most valuable place in, in Hamburg and invested much of that back into education. Uh, the Dutch are creating actually new industries, ways to, to protect their city. So finally, the Dutch said, pointed out that, like many of us have said, you have to engage the whole community, you have to bring people together, and we need to assert a new era of strong public leadership. As we have asked government to do less and less, or some of us, one of the things that we are doing is, is greatly weakening our ability, the leadership we will need to come together for an era of resilience. So thank you very much, and uh, <laughs> look forward to questions later.